On Thursday, August 14, 1980, between noon and 1 p.m., in the bedroom of a West Los Angeles house, Dorothy Stratton, a 20-year-old Canadian film actress and Playboy magazine's then-current Playmate of the Year, was tortured and killed by her estranged husband, 28-year-old Paul Snyder. Before murdering Dorothy, Snyder put her into a bondage machine of his own design. He then raped and brutally sodomized her. After freeing her, he fired a shotgun point-blank at the left side of her face. She was dead before the sound reached her ears. The tip of her left forefinger had been shot off in the explosion, so it was apparent that the last thing Dorothy did was to raise her left hand to her face. During the next hour, Snyder moved the corpse across the room to the bed and had intercourse with it at least once before writing a terse suicide note. He then turned the shotgun on himself. At 12.30 p.m., private detective Mark L. Goldstein, who had been hired by Snyder to follow Dorothy, called from his car phone and was told by Snyder that all was going well. Soon after 2 p.m., he called again, but received no answer. That evening, Patty Lorman and Dr. Steve Kushner, friends of Snyder's who were living in his house, became concerned about his unanswered ringing phone. At around 10.30, Goldstein called the doctor, again from his car phone, and asked him to check Snyder's room while Goldstein held on. The doctor and Patty went downstairs, found the door unlocked, and opened it. Lorman, horrified, fled from the room, returned to the phone, and told Goldstein what they had found. Goldstein said he would notify the police and be right over. The doctor went into the room. Snyder was lying on the floor. His face blasted away. There was an arc of his brains and blood splattered across one wall and the entire ceiling. It was later ascertained that he had been on his knees when he pulled the trigger, and the impact had ricocheted him forward onto the floor with the weapon frozen in his hands. Dorothy did not look dead. Her torso was draped over the end of the bed, her hair hanging down, still vibrant. There were bloody finger marks on her buttocks and one shoulder. The coroner later found semen in her vagina and rectum. The violent sodomy had disfigured her. A long black line of ants and other insects led to her face with a similar trail crawling toward Snyder's head. Goldstein arrived within minutes without having phoned the police. After an unspecified amount of time in the murder room, he finally notified the authorities. Later, police detective Richard DeAnda would tell me he thought Goldstein morally responsible for the crime. Goldstein knew of Snyder's mood over the past weeks, knew of the drugs and sex perversions Snyder had indulged in, knew of his fury over being barred from the Playboy Mansion five days earlier, and knew of Snyder's attempts to secure a weapon. In fact, Goldstein had even gone shopping with Snyder for a gun. When this trip was unsuccessful, Goldstein gave him his copy of the Recycler, through which Snyder found his weapon. Goldstein, said Deanda, should have warned someone. Immediately after the police arrived, Goldstein reached Hugh M. Hefner by phone with the news that Stratton and Snyder were dead. Murder-suicide? Hefner asked to confirm his first searing thought. The skin on Hefner's body, his secretary Terry would recall, seemed to be moving as he spoke. All the blood had drained from his face. Several of his staff had been trying desperately to reach Stratton for the past 24 hours. The first call Hefner made was to me.
I had been worried about Dorothy ever since she left my house that morning. Hefner told me a few days earlier that he had barred Snyder from his mansion, assuming I knew the impact this would have, but I had never met Snyder and unfortunately knew little about him. Surely Hefner knew precisely what Snyder was like. He had often been to the mansion in the past 18 months. His vulgarity and strutting machismo were contrary to the Hefner style, which was far more insidious and subterranean. Snyder's sleazy taste and braggadocia were a little too crass. Dime store pimps like he was could sully the fine liberal name of Playboy and of Hugh Hefner, who had become a kind of Walt Disney of pornography homogenized for the masses. Although Snyder wasn't respectable, the girl he married was. Tall, blonde, blue-eyed, thin but voluptuous, Dorothy Stratton was the quintessential American sweetheart, maybe a little too beautiful to be the girl next door. She was an A-minus high school graduate who was especially interested in law and acting and who expressed herself best in poems. Kind, selfless, and good-natured, Dorothy was an angel in the shape of Aphrodite. Her beauty, a friend of mine would say, had a kind of genius. I first met Dorothy Stratton at the Playboy Mansion in late October of 1978, at about the time that Snyder made his initial appearance there for the annual Halloween party. That was when Hefner told Dorothy that Snyder looked like a pimp. She laughed and said that was only his costume, but she knew it was the way he normally dressed. Dorothy had had only one boyfriend before Snyder seduced her. An unhappy adolescent affair that lasted a year and yielded few happy memories, none of them sexual. When Snyder walked into the Vancouver Dairy Queen, where Dorothy was working in late 1977, he had been on the city streets since he was 14 and had practiced his skills on women and lived off them for over a decade. By the time Dorothy turned 18 the following February 28, Snyder had launched his campaign and managed to convince her that she was in love. He thought that the extraordinary sensation of a first orgasm would enslave a naive, romantic young girl like Dorothy Ruth Hoog Stratton. He figured he would be able to get her to do whatever he wanted for a while, and what he wanted most was for her to strip for Playboy's 25th anniversary Playmate contest, which would close in August 1978, half a year before Dorothy would turn 19 the legal age of consent in Canada. But Dorothy refused to pose nude. She begged Snyder not to bring up that subject again. She could hardly stand to take off her clothes at school or even in front of her mother, but he persisted. Playboy was the only way to get into the movies. Hadn't he been around the big world of showbiz? Wasn't he a successful promoter? experienced in the ways of Las Vegas and Hollywood? Wasn't Playboy now sold in stores all over the land? This was the age of liberation for men and women. All the movie stars were showing their bodies freely. Hadn't she heard of the sexual revolution? It took Snyder six months of constant pressure and then he still had to trick Dorothy into a situation with a photographer she knew and trusted because he had taken her high school pictures. When she cried, Snyder said, do it for me, baby, do it for me. Within days after she finally posed, Snyder made Playboy aware of Dorothy Stratton. Within two weeks, she was in Hollywood. During her first days at the Playboy Mansion, she was propositioned by numerous men, several of them famous, and then seduced by Hugh Hefner. Two years later, almost to the day, she was tortured, raped, and murdered.
When the phone finally rang in the last quarter hour of August 14th, I was certain it was Dorothy calling to say that everything was all right. But the voice on the other end of the line wasn't Dorothy's. It was Hugh Hefner, and I heard him say, Dorothy's dead. I could hear in his terrified voice that he wasn't mistaken or trying in some dreadful way to be funny. The phone receiver slipped from my hand and fell to the floor, and Hefner's words echoed through me. Dorothy? Dead? Why not say the world had blown up and all of us were dead? Everything that had ever happened to me in my life, everything in which I had ever believed, had been proved in one blinding explosion to be conclusively wrong. If Dorothy was dead, life was a terrible joke. I was in the video room with Blaine Novak and Douglas Dilge, two associates from They All Laughed, the picture we had all just completed in New York, and I could hear Novak trying to console me and felt his arms on my shoulders. I wanted to shrug him off violently and run through the house and out to the car. Dilge was on the phone with Hefner, who gave as few of the details as he felt necessary and Doug was reluctant to repeat even those. I had to plead before he would speak. Shotgun, he said, shot himself too. They were dead together. It would be more than a week before I heard a hint of the torture Dorothy had been put through before the murder. More than a month before the details became horribly clear. A sound went through me, a growl that became a shriek. Then suddenly I remembered the movie Dorothy and I had made. It had been killed as well. It's two hours, a moving photo album of our days together. But the comedy had turned to tragedy. Eight days later, the ashes of Dorothy Stratton's body were buried in an oak casket, less than a 10 minute drive from the homes of the three men who had most influenced her life and death, less than a few yards from the remains of the last great love goddess of the screen, Marilyn Monroe. Monroe was born the same year as Hugh Hefner, founder of a magazine and proselytizer of a lifestyle that had helped to destroy both women. Dorothy's mother, Nellie Shock, in her grief, allowed her new husband to make the decision regarding the body of the stepdaughter he had met only once. It was burned to a few handfuls of ashes. Most of the people responsible for the event were at the funeral. The only exception, besides the Snyder lawyer and the Snyder private eye, was the man who pulled the trigger. His body was returned to Canada for burial. Nellie made the decision to bury her eldest child in Los Angeles because she would be close to the people she loved. Dorothy's younger sister, Louise, had finally told Nellie about Dorothy and me, and Nellie said she had flown to the States partly to meet the only man who ever made Dorothy happy. Her daughter, she said, had not had much happiness in her life. Dorothy asked her mother less than four months earlier to come to New York to talk about her problems. But Nellie had just met the man she would marry and he did not want her to leave. She would never forgive him for that or herself for not going. Hugh Hefner was at the funeral, as was his chief photographer, Mario Casilli, who quit Playboy shortly after Dorothy's murder. Though he had worked for that magazine for 20 years, since then he has refused print assignments that involve nudity. Dorothy's new young lawyer, whom she had met only once, a day before the killing, was there too, and the young business manager who had genuinely cared for her and tried to help, who had known what trouble Snyder was for her. Dorothy's father was there too. Simon Hoogstratton had neither contributed to her welfare, seen, nor contacted her since she was four. Though he didn't respond to Dorothy's invitation to her high school graduation, 
he somehow felt obliged to appear at her funeral. His eyes looked haunted, his expression frozen in shock. He had the look of a man who could not allow himself to think of the terrible mistakes he had made. The more he heard about the lost daughter, the more he must have realized that Dorothy would have loved him. Beyond devotion, if she had been given even the smallest chance. He was the one who could have thrown Snyder out the first time he appeared in Pimp's Furs to take the eldest daughter on a date. A girl needed a father to warn her of the evils of men. Less than three months earlier, in New York, Dorothy had told me that she didn't like her father. Nellie would not go near the grave. She stayed in front of the chapel while the others went to stand under the large tree near the mound of freshly dug earth. Her face remained tightly closed off, beyond grief. A large part of her had died with the child she had loved the longest for nearly half her life. Her new husband would never understand, and Nellie would be separated from him permanently before the end of the year. My oldest daughter, Antonia, held back her tears, as did Dorothy's sister, Louise. Her brother, John, wept openly, and so did my younger daughter, Alexandra. I looked out at the sun breaking through the leaves onto the grass under the tree and imagined Dorothy dancing there, free and happy. Because her ashes were the only weight in the coffin, it took a long time to descend into the grave. As the casket clanked downward, Hefner stood, white and shaken, next to Cassilli. I remembered his words a few days earlier when he told me that he would never get over what happened. Certainly, the last thing Hefner wanted was for Dorothy to die. The shock and fear in his eyes was genuine, impossible to hide or feign. He looked truly humbled, desperate for this day to end. Was he sharing with me similar feelings of guilt and remorse? A desperate ache to turn back time and do things differently? Would he share the relentless series of confrontations with himself about his culpability in the tragedy? Will the words echo endlessly for both of us? If only we had known. The remains of the body that Cassilli had photographed so intimately for Hefner and for the boys of the world passed them. Was Cassilli remembering how Dorothy had cried when she first posed naked? Was Hefner thinking of their secret time in the jacuzzi? Dorothy might forgive them, of course. She might even forgive Snyder. But I could not. Not him, not Hefner, not myself. If I had known more, I could have saved her. It was not only my lack of specific information and of other people's motives, but a fatal lack of intuitive awareness about people's duplicity. All this cost me the most cherished love of my life. As the months and years of investigation went on, and I found out more and more about Hefner's role in the events, my rage toward him grew. If I had to confront my own responsibility, there could be no way to ignore his. Perhaps the case I have built against Hefner in my mind and heart may be viewed by others as a way out of my own agony. But revealing the truth about his actions does not alter my own, nor lessen the awful awareness that, if I had done certain things differently, understood more quickly, Dorothy would still be alive. None of the extenuating circumstances, nor the guilt that Hefner must bear, nor the mistakes so many others made can ever change that terrible knowledge for me. When people read of the death of Dorothy Stratton, they shook their heads and talked about the eternal triangle. It was the age-old story. Play with explosives and they blow up. Even I believed it as the only living member of that triangle. But as I tried to find the truth, I discovered a fourth side to the figure, 
hidden and dark. Eventually, there would be no doubt in my mind that if the shadowy Hefner side of the pyramid had never existed, Dorothy would not have died. She could have dealt with Paul Snyder, a small town pimp who first spotted and sold her, but she could not handle the slick professional machinery of the Playboy sex factory, nor the continual efforts of its founder to bring her into his personal fold, no matter what she wanted. The minister read the words, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. And I thought, What good is any of that now to Dorothy? Where was God when she was alive? How could a woman so full of grace and talent be senselessly murdered in her twenty-first summer? Her voice was in my ear, in the soft wind through the trees. Throw the rose on the coffin, Peter. It's time. They've suffered enough. And I took three steps forward, looked down into the grave at the coffin, and let the pink flower fall. Jean and the girls did the same, and Hefner and Mario, and we all walked away. On the last full day we would ever have alone together, in London, Dorothy had asked me if I would make a sad love story for her. And we both smiled, remembering the popular novel and movie she liked. I grinned and asked what kind of sad love story she had in mind. One in which there was a death at the end? And she nodded a barely perceptible yes. Our smiles faded and we looked at each other for a long moment. I touched her cheek and promised that I would, and she smiled softly. The love story Dorothy requested turned out to be our own, as she had feared and as I could never have imagined. To tell that story now, I would have to understand how all of us ended up there, standing in the blazing August sun, under an old sheltering tree, to bury the mortal remains of this dazzling, brilliant woman. Thornton Wilder wrote, There is a land of the living and a land of the dead, and the bridge is love, the only survival, the only meaning. And so, for Dorothy, because she was the noblest person I ever met, the gentlest and the bravest, how better could I serve her memory or keep her love and spirit alive than to honor her with the whole truth and nothing but until death do us join. This, then, is for you, D.R., the one you asked for in London a little more than two weeks before you were murdered. The fourth wall of the pyramid was begun before Dorothy was born, when Hefner, an enterprising 27-year-old Midwesterner, came up with an idea. Take masturbation out of the bathroom and put it on the newsstands. In late 1953, when the first issue of Playboy appeared, it was revolutionary in its obvious approach to men's fantasies. But it gained a measure of respectability as the years went by when the Supreme Court ruled, by implication, that Playboy articles were of redeeming social value. In its first year, the magazine's circulation grew from 70,000 to 175,000. In 20 years, Playboy sold more than 6 million copies monthly. An extremely shy young man from a strict Methodist family, young Hugh was a virgin through military service and into his 20s. And then there was a tremendous setback in his romantic life. His boyhood sweetheart, his first real-life pinup, made him a cuckold. 
Earlier in the same year Dorothy was killed, a book was published, Thy Neighbor's Wife, by Gay Talese, which told most of the story. Hefner himself, and the ex-Mrs. Hefner, had given Talese all the details of the one great disappointment of his life. The book reported how Mildred, the girl he had always planned to marry, his one and only love, had broken down during a movie they were attending. Its crime story seemed to parallel hers, and confessed soon after that for more than a year she had been having an affair with another man. Mildred had told young Hefner that of course she understood why he wouldn't want to marry her now. But young Hef did marry Mildred. He forgave her. Also, he told Talise, for a time, having been alarmed by the competition, he wanted Mildred more than ever. She bore him two children, a girl and a boy, yet the relationship didn't survive. Although he was still married, Hefner roamed about, lost. He continued to read sex books and any pornography he could find, and masturbated regularly. His favorite dream was to strip and seduce everybody's girl next door, the one who had broken his heart. Until Playboy arrived, pornography was not easily accessible to the average man, and it was embarrassing to buy. Then, in 1951, Marilyn Monroe's nude calendar photograph scandalized the country. Marilyn had done the photo two years before, but her subsequent popularity in movies brought it to light. She apologized to the public. The calendar sold out and secured her stardom. The interest in Marilyn's nude picture did not escape the notice of Hugh Marston Hefner. He put up $600 of his own money, borrowed more from his parents, among others, and set up shop in the kitchen of his small apartment. He paid his secretaries a little extra to strip and pose and created the first mass circulation magazine to openly encourage male masturbatory fantasies. And the increasingly impressive bylines on Playboy articles gave it a patina of respectability. To the men and boys of the world, Hefner became the great emancipator, a swinger who shared the wealth, a liberal thinker who rode the crest of a revolution that changed the nation. The concept of mass publishing pictures of female physical perfection did not originate with Hefner. In the 1940s, Esquire started printing a monthly fold-out Varga drawing of a slightly naughty but dreamily hygienic showgirl. The work had a certain wit, an awareness on the part of the models and artists of the purpose of the drawing. It was a kind of fancified art deco erotica in which Varga and his anonymous girls were collaborators. The not-so-subtle smirk in the drawings gave each woman the look of an experienced hooker. Hefner removed the smirk and the artist, replaced the showgirl with the girl next door, and used glamorous color photography aided by all the tricks of the trade. Lenses, filters, makeup, touch-up. The profound difference to the reader was that Hefner's model purposed to be real. There was no artistic license to consider. Weren't these, then, photographs of the perfect woman? Three years after Monroe's calendar story broke, and five years after she posed, the cover of the rather tame first issue of Playboy featured a poor wire service photo of Marilyn waving, accompanied by the blurb. First time in any magazine, full color, the famous Marilyn Monroe nude. Marilyn had no control over the picture and received no money, but the issue sold. 
by the time Dorothy Ruth Hoogstrand was born in a Salvation Army hospital in Vancouver six years later, Playboy's circulation was 1.1 million. And the legend persisted that the first woman to pose naked for the magazine was Marilyn Monroe. Hefner and his organization did as much as they could over the years to encourage that misconception. In 1984, they would headline the last nude photo of Marilyn Monroe. When Playboy celebrated its 10th anniversary, Dorothy was four and her father had already deserted her and her mother and brother. Somehow Nellie managed to make enough money cleaning other people's homes to feed the two children. At the age of seven, Dorothy began doing odd jobs to help out while Nellie studied practical nursing. Meanwhile, as Playboy turned 13, Hefner was reportedly well past Don Giovanni's thousand and three conquests. In those days, all the action was still at the Chicago mansion. Dominated by an indoor swimming pool with a glassed-in ceiling, round-the-clock kitchen staff and waiters, plenty of new or would-be playmates in residence, Hefner's Home for Young Women virtually advertised sexual satisfaction guaranteed. The 60s were Hefner's golden decade. The magazine and the Playboy clubs around the country were thriving. Now, what did Mildred think of her cuckold ex-husband? Had he shown her sufficiently what she had given up? The hero of millions? He had made it easy for her. If she wanted to see by whom she had been replaced, she had only to open the latest issue a catalog of her ex-husband's victories, easily available across the nation. It was the cuckold's ultimate revenge. By the end of the 60s, I had reached 30, had made only one unsuccessful film, had a very lovely daughter, but was beginning to realize I had married too young, hardly knowing myself very well, much less my wife. By the early 70s, my life had been changed completely. A second beautiful daughter had been born, but the marriage had ended, and another long-term relationship had begun. My father had died, and three consecutive films of mine, The Last Picture Show, What's Up Doc, and Paper Moon, had become critical and popular successes. I was suddenly a wealthy, famous young man, but I was still a long way from understanding myself, the woman I lived with, or the world around us. In 1972, Playboy invaded my life. Its editor had, without permission, extracted from picture show two frames of Sybil Shepherd naked and printed them. Shepherd and I were then living together. While moviegoers had seen less than seven seconds of her nude and in constant motion, Playboy readers could gaze endlessly at the poorly reproduced photographs. Moreover, her appearance in the magazine would seem to have been with her approval, even though she had expressly forbidden any still shots of those brief sequences. The following year, Sybil sued Playboy and Hugh Hefner personally, for nine million dollars. The 70s were far less secure than the 60s for the Playboy empire. The Shepherd lawsuit and others like it took their toll, and there were drug problems as well. One of Hefner's private secretaries, Bobby Arnstein, became involved in a cocaine connection and subsequently committed suicide. Anti-Hefner rumors in Chicago were rampant, but the Mansion West had been opened and he had begun to spend most of his time in Southern California. He was 47 and living mainly with dark-haired Barbie Benton. He also had committed himself to regular orgies. It was this predilection that finally, he would tell me, drove Barbie away. Also in 1973, Willie Ray, a woman of 23, 
died of a drug overdose in Canada. It had been exactly two years since she left her native Vancouver, changed her name from Wilhelmina Reitwald, posed for and appeared in Playboy. Mario Casilli took all her pictures. For a time, Willie had been a mansion regular. The story never received much publicity, and Playboy pretended it had never happened. They told Dorothy Stratton that she was the first Canadian to appear in the magazine. By the end of the 70s, things looked bad for me. Although Sippel had two successes on her own, The Heartbreak Kid and Taxi Driver, two films we had done together, Daisy Miller and At Long Last Love, had failed at the box office. Another of mine, Nickelodeon, had also fallen below expectations critically and with the public. The Shepard lawsuit was settled by the payment to her of all illegal fees and half the movie rights to a book Playboy owned and would produce if I directed. This picture, St. Jack, which they did not finally produce, though Hefner's name appeared on it, eventually became a success this time, but not a financial winner. The enforced separations Sybil and I endured because of studio resistance to our working together eventually helped to break up our relationship. Sybil married a hometown man and almost immediately had the child she had wanted to share with me. I felt adrift and rudderless. A great many women entered my life, too many to do me any permanent good. When my mother died of cancer, my daughters and younger sister looked to me as head of the family, but I was not able to help anyone. I had few male friends. My closest relationships were always with women. I had been married faithfully to Polly Platt, with whom I had two daughters for almost nine years, and Sybil and I had a marriage in all but name for the next eight. There followed more than a year of devastating promiscuity, which left me exhausted and miserable, hoping for an enduring bond that would never lose its strength or magic. By 1978, Hefner and his associates were in the midst of their most expensive promotional campaign, the international search for Playboy's 25th anniversary playmate. Hefner personally told me of the quest for a quarter-century centerfold and ran a short promotional film for me at the mansion. The Shepherd lawsuit had been settled amicably after Hefner himself came to my house to discuss the terms. The four-minute journey had been one of the conditions, and Hefner had borne the indignity with only a touch of irritation. His retribution was always covert. He invited Sybil and me to become regulars at mansion weekends and parties and said he would see that our names were placed on the gang list, which meant either of us could drop over any time. Our greatest enemy had somehow become a friendly acquaintance, anxious to be more. When Hefner took Sybil and me on a tour of his upstairs quarters, a lot of Barbie Benton's things were still there. The two were then in the process of their final split. She had become fed up with Hefner and his weekly sex parties. We had heard rumors about the private games at the mansion, but details at the time were scarce. The implications behind the special Hefner tour of his bedrooms and bath were not difficult to read. Most obvious being the moment when he hinted broadly that we join him some time for a little jacuzzi. The raised eyebrows of hope and the sideways smile did it for Sybil. She told me later that she had felt nauseated. The first insider to speak candidly to me about the Hefner orgies was Patrick Curtis, a year and a half after the murder. Curtis had a showbiz head start on most of us, having played Melanie's newborn baby in Gone with the Wind. Subsequently, he had acted for years on TV and in pictures before becoming a producer. It was he who brought Raquel Welch to the screen 
and they were married for several years. When they broke up and a later romance ended badly, Curtis took to going to Hefner's. He was chagrined that he had participated in some of the orgies and decided he would just as soon not go back. The rules of the orgy, Curtis explained, were easy. Anything went, or anyone. He mentioned the hundreds of times one of Hefner's women had gone downstairs and invited the new girl from Iowa or Missouri or Montana. Suddenly the girl found herself in a situation she would never have tolerated back home. But this was Hollywood, the young women would think. This was the modern world. Didn't everybody do it this way? These girls were passed among several men and women in one night. Everybody who wanted to watched, and the spectator participant list included many famous names, including the king of Playboy. The girls end up just lying there, Curtis said. Anyone who wants to get on is okay. Most of my visits to the mansion were innocent. A game or two of pinball, chit-chat and a sandwich, a movie, a fight on closed-circuit TV, my first experience as a single guest at a Playboy party was strangely prophetic. The 19-year-old with whom I struck up a conversation turned out to be Hefner's date for the late evening orgy that night. Call her Tammy. The first thing she said to me was that we were being watched, but I was far too naive about the Playboy scene to take the words seriously, though I followed her into a deserted room so that we could talk more privately. Tammy said that everyone had been telling her she ought to pose for Playboy, but she didn't know if she should or not. They said it was a good way to break into the movies. I told her it was about the worst way and eventually convinced her to agree to take a ride to my house, where we could talk unobserved. I promised to bring her back whenever she wanted and meant it. She was far more innocent than she looked or tried to act, I realized, and hoped first to make her trust me, and then talk her out of the playboy idea, knowing that no one in Hollywood considered the playmates anything more than glorified call girls. Playmates were usually gone in 30 days, as soon as the next issue appeared. Yet I never got to say all that to Tammy. She had been right. We were being observed and followed. A mansion regular arrived to break up our conversation, and then, when Tammy came out front to join me at my car, Hefner appeared, flanked by several angry-looking buddies. He said he had a date with the lady after the party. It had been planned for some time. We were simply taking a ride, I said, and would return within an hour. But as I spoke, I could see Tammy being maneuvered backward into the house by the regulars. She looked frightened. Hefner was smiling solicitously and explaining that he and Tammy had arranged the state several days ago. Since I was there for the first time, I felt that I had broken a cardinal rule. I caught a glimpse of the top of Tammy's head as she was being swallowed up among the crowd and tried to joke with Hefner, saying, I thought I was the guest here, Hef, but he had the ready answer for that one. I'm not that good a host. His place, I said, was like the greatest boys' camp ever built, and Hefner's smile faded. After a couple of Playboy years, I heard much later, Tammy had become a high-priced call girl in Paris. None of the other Playboy girls I would come to know ended up much better. The regular weekday Monopoly games were almost always played by an all-male cast. The occasional women were spoken for observers, or one of Hefner's private secretaries. His special lady of the moment, Sandra Theodore then, sometimes joined us. It was a custom-made Monopoly set, and each of the regulars had a playing token specifically molded in his image. I was left to choose one of the remaining tokens and always picked the anonymous Playboy Bunny to represent me. This never failed to get a laugh and discussion from the players, who thought I was being either ironic or perverse. 
The truth is, I genuinely empathized far more with the Playboy women than with the Playboy men, and therefore had more sympathy for them as well. Often the same regulars would congregate in the game house, a few yards away from the main building, where they would play pinball, pool, and other penny arcade games, while the jukebox cranked out hits from the 30s and 40s, Hefner's youth. His eyes would tear at the sentimental love songs of Sinatra and Nat King Cole. Hefner was always pointedly warm and solicitous, kidding around and treating me like a son or younger brother. In the Monopoly games, he made a show of giving me what seemed like fair advice, because I was not a regular player and therefore at a disadvantage. It didn't matter. I always lost. Hefner and I got into a couple of serious conversations about my troubled career and my indecision as to what to do next. His advice seemed well-meant and genuine, though of course it all added up to my directing the picture he and Sybil now owned. When I spoke of my love for Sybil, his eyes misted over and his smile looked sad. He said he didn't think he could ever be faithful to one woman again. No single woman could satisfy him now. And I would contradict him and say that if the right woman came along, he could fall in love and be happy with her. But Hefner shook his head and said he doubted it. I bought Hefner's generally affable and admiring personal attitude and found him likable in short doses. I quickly tired of the Monopoly games, though the last time I played, just before leaving for Singapore to direct the movie Playboy co-owned, I won. Hefner had been more than helpful in his assistance, and later I began to wonder if there hadn't been a fix. There were often film and TV celebrities at the mansion, Warren Beatty, Ryan O'Neill, and others less easily recognizable. I thought of those times I had seen one of the most notorious movie star studs with Hefner at the mansion, the two of them sharing an easy familiarity. There were frequent macho innuendos in the banter between them, especially the time they strolled around a new toy Hefner had just purchased. They called it a fuck chair. It looked more like an old shoe shine stand. There were so many different places to put hands, feet, knees, and rear. The men were chuckling as they circled the contraption, exchanging ideas on how many different sexual positions could be assumed. They were discussing their knowledge of the secrets of the bedroom wars, the technique of the great lovers. Hold off, make love so that the woman has several orgasms before the man, then thrust home a hero every time. How long a man could hold out, therefore, was part of the test of coxmanship, and most of their references were to that ability. What they extolled wasn't pleasure for both men and women, but men's exercise of power over women. Early in 1980, a new book came out that revealed a little more of Hefner, though I didn't read it until over two years later. Mike McGrady had written the Linda Lovelace bestseller, Ordeal, in which some Hefner orgies were described. The most chilling story dealt with Hefner's desire to see a dog screw Linda, or any other woman. It wasn't Lovelace he was interested in, it was watching bestiality. He owned several stag reels of similar events, but had never actually seen the live action. Linda's husband, promoter, manager, had been threatening for years to kill her if she wouldn't do precisely as she was told, so she consented to let Hefner and the other regulars watch while she supposedly attempted to get the dog to make it with her. She was, in truth, subtly doing the opposite, and the dog refused to perform. Hefner was disappointed, but philosophical. On another occasion, in the jacuzzi during one of the regular orgies, Hefner sodomized Linda Lovelace. If, in his most private moments, Hefner had any thought that it might be possible to pull himself back to the romantic idealism of his youth, there was a way. Find and create a star. As playboy, his alter ego, 
neared its 25th birthday, he needed that movie star, his own Garbo, Dietrich, or Harlow. He knew the Monroe connection was fake and wanted a real sex goddess to emerge from the pages of Playboy. Without that, it would be too easy to write off his women as one-month wonders of no further interest, even to their readers, after the usual four weeks of masturbatory guilts and pleasures. The great 25th anniversary playmate hunt was conceived as a quick way to spin spread a vast dragnet to find the silver star for Hefner to expose and possess, an enduring sex goddess of talent and beauty who would gain the respect and admiration of the world, the grand validation. In the meantime, as friend to the famous, he plied the picture people with drinks and food and entertainment and women and used their names to make his establishment all the more respectable. Some people even believed that Jimmy Carter's candid interview in Playboy just before the election had supplied the winning margin. In 25 years, Hefner had gone from porn king to king maker. But without a star, what did it all add up to? A desire for bestiality? Sodomy with the heroine of Deep Throat? Hefner's fervent, unspoken prayers centered on the greatest dream girl of all time. When Dorothy Hugh Stratton turned 13, the usual adolescent unhappiness that accompanies that age didn't push her out into the world of her peers as it does with most. She retreated into herself, stayed in her room, started smoking. By the time she was 16, she had developed an ulcer. Dorothy began to write poems as a way of thinking to herself and of communicating with others. She wrote on scraps of paper, envelopes, school assignments. She gave many away to friends. At 14, she began a part-time job in a Dairy Queen. It was great to get work that young, she would write. But I turned 15 and 16 and 17, and at 18 I was still working there, wearing a little red uniform with my hair in pigtails. Dorothy was not so different from most girls in North America, more sensitive and beautiful, perhaps, more curious and kind. She stood out, but was by no means unique in her experiences and reactions to men. She was as insecure as most, as anxious to grow up and be a big girl, to do something with her life and to find happiness. All the various lifestyle advertisements that bombarded Dorothy were as confusing to her as they were to most of us. Unlike many, however, she wanted to find answers, to help others to find them. For her friends Geraldine and Cheryl, she wrote, Remember the fine times of the past, but bring forth finer times of the future, and think not of what we are missing, but what we are gaining. Yet Dorothy often had nightmares. She would wake up sweating and crawl into her younger sister's bed. Several poems revealed that she frequently had death on her mind. A foot meets the pavement for a moment, the remains of a lowly earthworm whose life was terminated in the creation of a footprint dries up slowly. At its journey's end, a foot dries up slowly in a coffin only to be transformed into soil by a lowly earthworm. Late in 1977, Paul Leslie Snyder entered the Dairy Queen where Dorothy was working and appraised her knowingly to see if she might be a good candidate for the streets, but quickly realized her pigtails and innocent smile were genuine. He was right. She would not be 18 for another couple of months. But Snyder was in no hurry. He figured this one had playboy potential. During that New Year's weekend, Dorothy broke up with her first boyfriend. She had been sleeping with him for a year and hating it. Later, she wrote of him. Sometimes we'd get along really well, and then he would... 
ruin everything by dragging me to the bedroom. I dreaded that so much, but felt I owed it to him. Sometimes I thought that was all he wanted from me, because he used to get angry when I refused him. I thought sex was the most animalistic and beastly thing ever to be invented. Steve never pleased me. I dreaded the end of the night when I had to give myself up to him. It was sort of like a game I kept losing, and that was how I lost. But she kept thinking there was something wrong with her. Maybe she was frigid. When Steve maliciously destroyed the Christmas present it had taken her months to pay for, Dorothy ended the relationship. Shortly afterward, Snyder called again at the Dairy Queen and began his attempts to win her. It didn't take long. The first boyfriend's thoughtless, patronizing manner, their painful bedroom scenes, her mother's unpleasant experiences with men, the boys and men on the streets who threatened or tormented her or exposed themselves to her, her father's desertion, all these had prepared Dorothy for the friendly, almost paternal approach from a man eight years older who seemed to be kind, considerate, and successful. Snyder also knew the right buttons to push romantically. When Dorothy felt an orgasm for the first time, she believed some part of herself would be forever in his debt. What she had discovered in her own body and heart, she identified with Snyder and clung to him as the source, not realizing she had really found it in herself. The explosion had awakened something powerful. Perhaps this was love, she thought, though she would write, If you don't know what love is, how are you supposed to know if you're in love? Yet the lovely secret she shared with Paul couldn't be explained to Louise or John or to her mother. This was so much closer to those stars you were supposed to see when love struck. Sleeping Beauty, after all, arose through the kiss of the prince. It was a pervasive male fantasy. The beautiful, submissive princess awakened to the beauties of life and love through the gentle touch of a prince. Sleeping Beauty, unlike Eve, lived happily ever after, but then Eve presumed to taste the fruit of wisdom. Learn the moral well, girls. Don't awaken on your own. Wait for a man. Dorothy thought she had fallen in love. Nellie tried to warn her about Snyder, but then Dorothy would have thought her mother hadn't the best luck with men. Her first husband had run off. Her second husband and boyfriends had often been unkind to the kids. One had broken Johnny's arm and bloodied Dorothy's nose. Dorothy would have better luck. At least Paul brought her presents. He was stern sometimes, but he never yelled. Not at first. The repeated protests of her family and friends only helped to create a Romeo and Juliet fantasy that Snyder inflamed and used to his own advantage. He continually tried to cajole Dorothy into posing naked for Playboy, though the thought terrified her so that she cried each time. She did not know that he had been a pimp in various cities for over a decade, that he had worked in his father's sweatshop as a leather cutter by day and worked the streets at night, learning from white and black pimps how to manipulate young women. He gave them marijuana while he used cocaine. Those who could afford it rubbed coke on the penis, which, serving as an anesthetic, prolongs an erection and delays orgasm. Inhaling it numbs the feelings as well, so that a man becomes a mindless, battering ram in pursuit of senseless, destructive pleasure. At the local night spots, everybody knew Snyder and treated him as a celebrity. Dorothy felt privileged to be with him. She didn't know that on the streets Snyder was called the Jewish pimp, that he had for several years dealt in drugs and prostitution, not only in Vancouver, but in Seattle, Las Vegas, San Francisco, and Los Angeles, nor that he had been arrested numerous times by, by the vice squad and that, to gain release, he would inform on other pimps and pushers. To Dorothy.
To Dorothy, he was a promoter, a producer. He put on a couple of car shows that summer of 1978, but no one told her that he had been forced, on the last car show he had worked, to sell his share for cash to save his life. Snyder had gotten involved with the girlfriend of a local mobster who was serving time in jail. He even used the mobster's money to pay for plastic surgery on the girl's breasts. When the man got out, he found Snyder and held him by the ankles out a window 30 stories from the ground. Snyder cried and pleaded and promised all his money. Afterward, he left town for nearly a year. He had just returned when he first spotted Dorothy. As Dorothy celebrated her 18th birthday, Snyder continued his calculated attentions to her. A lavish gift, retreat, another lavish gift, plenty of romantic dialogue. The talk of posing for Playboy increased monthly. As time was running out for the contest, Snyder applied pressure weekly. Eventually, Dorothy's mother inadvertently played into his hands by going to Europe for three weeks at the start of August. First, Snyder made a deal with Hugh Meyer, the local photographer who had taken Dorothy's high school graduation picture. If Meyer would help Snyder convince Dorothy to strip for Playboy and they used the pictures, Snyder would give him the $1,000 finder's fee. The photos, Dorothy was told, were to be portraits of both her and Snyder, but after a few of those were shot, the truth came out. She later would describe to actress Molly Bachelor, her L.A. roommate, how Snyder had stripped to his shorts and assumed his favorite muscle man poses. He lovingly collected them of himself from every era and angle. Meyer and Snyder then tried to encourage Dorothy to take off her clothes too, and she cried. Snyder began pleading, do it for me, baby. He begged softly, please do it for me. Eventually, she did. Snyder would never give Meyer the finder's fee, but Meyer's photos would sell after Dorothy was killed. The Pulitzer Prize-winning article in the Village Voice used several. The few acceptable partially naked pictures Meyer got of an obviously frightened girl with a breathtaking face and body were enough to interest Ken Honey, a Vancouver photographer who had already sent several Canadian women to Playboy. Because Dorothy was underage, Honey said he would need her mother's or father's signature on the application. Snyder returned with Nellie's signature forged on the document, and the matter was dropped. Honey had taken one look at the photos and knew that he had found a girl in whom Hefner would be especially interested so he agreed to break precedent and shoot at Snyder's apartment instead of the usual session at his studio. To Dorothy, Snyder spoke with great enthusiasm of Playboy's interest and their high professional ethics. Today, everybody did Playboy. She posed, but she cried throughout the session and never for a moment stopped wishing it would end. Honey sent the photographs overnight to Los Angeles and Playboy VP Marilyn Grabowski instantly recognized what she had and immediately took the pictures to Hefner. He had despaired of finding the perfect playmate. The contest was about over, and although he had spent many pleasurable evenings appraising and sampling the contestants, he hadn't found that special one. She had to be a blonde with large breasts, a slim waist, and healthy buttocks. Tall, with a beautiful but innocent-looking face. The title character in Little Annie Fanny, the magazine's long-running cartoon serial, was Hefner's ideal. Later, he would plan a feature film with Dorothy Stratton as Annie. Although no woman possessed all of Hefner's requirements, Candy Loving from Oklahoma led the race. But she was a brunette, married and in her mid-twenties, hardly perfect for Hefner, who wanted the anniversary winner not only in his magazine, but also for himself. The Silver Star would be his new lady. 
When he saw Dorothy's photographs, he realized without a doubt that she was the girl of a million playboy fantasies. Less than two days after Hefner saw her photos, Dorothy arrived at his house. Honey had been instructed to get her there as soon as possible. Snyder objected when he heard there was only one round-trip ticket, but didn't suggest she refuse to go. He used the speed of Playboy's response to emphasize to Dorothy how right he was about her potential and the best way to exploit it. He instructed her to tell her brother she had a modeling job, and her supervisor at BC Telephone, where she had begun to work in June, that a family emergency had arisen and she had to be gone for a couple of days. On August 13th, 1978, Dorothy took an airplane for the first time in her life and, from L.A. International, her first limousine, to the Playboy building on the Sunset Strip. Marilyn Grabowski, who welcomed her, would later recall how Dorothy had tried to act older than her years. Grabowski led the way to the Playboy studio, where their veteran centerfold photographer, Mario Casilli, was waiting. His Italian Santa Claus looks were reassuring, and he, of course, was used to nervous young women. Dorothy was given a glass or two of white wine to relax her, and Casilli got as much as he needed. Afterward, Grabowski rode in the limousine with her to the mansion. Dorothy tried to put out of her mind one of the last things Snyder had said to her, that she might have to sleep with Hefner to win the contest, but that Snyder would understand as long as she came back to him, just as he had learned to say from all the pimps. A few months later, Snyder pressured Stratton to write a quick autobiography, The Revelations of a Playmate. After considerable badgering, she produced two brief chapters, 30 handwritten pages, before she quit. In New York, when I too suggested she make note of some of her experiences, Dorothy said, I'm not going to write it. I didn't learn of her efforts until a few months after the murder. When I read them, I discovered why she had stopped. Dorothy had begun to realize that the things she could tell were now outweighed by what she could not let Paul or anyone else read. The story was becoming a continuous series of omissions and half-truths, which wasn't Dorothy's style. She had stopped her book with the first clear sign of trouble in her relationship with Paul Snyder. She had written, He still couldn't figure out why I talked so little, and why I had such a hard time telling him something or answering his questions. Yet in the words she chose, she revealed her vulnerability and her willingness to look for the good in everyone. She had described her initial meeting with Hefner and with Patrick Curtis, as many a wide-eyed and terrified teenager might, on meeting her first celebrity. I thought my knees were going to go out from under me. Long after Dorothy was killed, Curtis would recall. She was shaking like a leaf, but when she walked into the mansion and out to the yard, people were just stunned. Dorothy wouldn't have known if it had come up and hit her on the nose. She was in a catatonic state, almost. She had described all this carefully in the aborted memoir. Soon after the murder, the police were secretly informed by journalist John Riley that Detective Goldstein had a number of Stratton's papers in his possession. Goldstein was ordered to turn over all materials, but he claimed they were given to him by Snyder and supplied only poor photocopies. In exchange for the tip, the police made a copy available to Riley. Hefner got wind of the existence of a Stratton journal, diary, or memoir, and, according to reports, became extremely agitated and most anxious to see the writings. Playboy demanded a copy from the police. They complied. Riley informed his lawyer, who was also Dorothy's lawyer, and the Stratton estate, the only legal owner of her writings, demanded all the originals and received only photocopies. Eventually, there was considerable speculation over which of the men at the mansion had made the one simple pass she mentioned in her memoir. In the posthumous Playboy tribute, Hefner would write, with a small rap on the knuckles, 
that the man had been Patrick Curtis, but Hefner had been co covering not only for himself, but for a much closer and more famous buddy, film star James Caan. Certainly Curtis had made it clear in a polite way that he found Dorothy attractive and desirable. But after she told him about the boyfriend in Vancouver, whom she loved and planned to marry, Curtis backed off and eventually became a good friend. With Khan, however, it was a different situation. Though he was a good actor, Dorothy thought, she certainly wasn't attracted to him and became embarrassed by his overt attentions. Then, in the midst of a sticky divorce, Khan was living full-time at the mansion and later would put even more pressure on Stratton. What really happened on the first visit Dorothy made to the Playboy Mansion exactly two years before Snyder killed her? It would be three and one half years, and Dorothy would be dead, before I would be told the full story. Curtis and one of the regular women talked her into a naked swim in the dark waters of the Jacuzzi Grotto by telling her that everyone swam there without bathing suits. Indeed, the swim passed innocently enough, but it would lead to her undoing. The three of them put on the house's white terry cloth robes, and Curtis led the two women to the game house. Again, he and the woman said everybody went around the mansion in towels and robes, but Dorothy's arrival in the game house after midnight did not pass without notice. Significant looks were exchanged between Hefner and several of the regulars. Everyone at Playboy already spoke of how much Hefner liked and wanted Dorothy. Wasn't she the perfect candidate they'd been seeking to celebrate his past 25 years? Khan's interest might have worried Hefner, but Dorothy's innocence would probably require a little pressure to break her in. Her sudden entrance with Curtis upset him. That Curtis, of all people, should have won not only Dorothy's confidence, but her body first, infuriated Hefner. Perhaps it embarrassed him in front of his friends. Hef made an assumption that was inaccurate, Curtis would say later. He never would have gone swimming with her alone, Patrick said, but with the other woman along, he thought it would be all right. Forgetting for a moment that to Hefner and his mansion pals, one man and two women, was less than the usual number of participants. I really feel badly about that, Curtis would tell me, because I feel that, to some extent, I'm responsible. At 1.30 in the morning, Dorothy was back in her room in a guest house by the tennis court when a phone call came from one of Hefner's private secretaries. Could she please join Mr. Hefner for a little swim in the jacuzzi? Dorothy was frightened, but more afraid to say no. Wouldn't it be an insult to refuse the employer and host what had not been denied to another guest? Dorothy wandered nervously around the deserted grounds before finding the grotto. She wrapped herself in a towel and waited for Hefner in the steamy darkness. An hour or two later, Curtis's phone rang. He had given Dorothy the number and told her to call it if she needed anything. She was sobbing bitterly. Curtis had to ask what was the matter several times before she told him what had happened with Hefner in the jacuzzi. She said that Hefner had told her afterward that he assumed she and Curtis had made love and that his ego was hurt. Dorothy, wretched and angry, wanted to know what she was supposed to do now. Is that part of the program? Is that what's expected of a playmate? Curtis assured her at length, that what had happened in the jacuzzi had nothing to do with her becoming the 25th anniversary playmate. He told her how much Hefner genuinely liked her, how really important she was to him, so that she would feel a bit better about herself, rather than like another piece of cheese. Curtis would recall, there was no question, she did not want it to happen again. She was trying to minimize the reality and look toward tomorrow to find out how she could extricate herself from a situation she didn't want to put herself in again. If Dorothy's anger and indignation did not move her to speak about the incident with anyone but Curtis, and later with Snyder, it was no doubt because she quickly realized how unbelievable her story would sound. 
asked down to the jacuzzi late at night? What did she think would happen? How could anyone be so naive? But knowing Dorothy, she was naive and did think that Hefner, like Curtis, only wanted a swim. In 1982, Ms. Magazine would run a cover piece that discussed the prevalence in our society of these forced seductions and of the women's problems in dealing not only with the often violent scenes, but with the guilt and complicity involved in the aftermath. The men acting as though this is what the women were asking for. Any outrage expressed by the women, therefore, was dismissible as hypocrisy. What had happened was the woman's own fault. Dorothy herself, at the age of 18, probably would not have spoken of the jacuzzi encounter in these terms, but knowing the circumstances and the principles involved, it is difficult to call her experience anything else. Soon after, Dorothy wrote a poem about the mansion, a place where everything was available but love, this Disneyland, she called it, where people are the games. After the initial weekend, Dorothy went back to Vancouver and tried unsuccessfully to save her BC telephone job by saying she needed a couple of weeks off for urgent family problems. She told her brother and sister, her mother was still in Europe, that she had received a modeling job in Los Angeles, and returned immediately. Playboy had said she was needed for three or four days, but after a week, they told her another few days would be necessary. In her caref careful memoir, she wrote, My visit extended to three weeks. Paul was getting more and more nervous every day. He would call the photographer in Vancouver and yell at him. He would call the photographer in L.A. and ask him questions. He called the studio, and he called the mansion three or four times a day. He couldn't figure out why I was staying so long. It was at this time that Dorothy often used the key Patrick Curtis had given her to his house. Whenever the pressure from Hefner or Kahn or any of the others became too strong, she left this kindness of Curtis's out of her memoir because it would lead to questions about the mansion she dared not touch. Patrick would understand, as one of only a handful of people who knew the real reason why Dorothy needed refuge and protection. Dorothy wrote of these circumstances. Sometimes I cried before I went to sleep. A lot of men were entering my life all of a sudden, and a lot of them wanted me. No one was ever pushy or forceful, but talk can be very powerful, especially to a mixed-up little girl, and I was getting confused. I was getting lonely and I was getting depressed. One night there was a huge pajama party. I got drunk and danced and ate and had a good time, and the next day I was in bed sick. Paul called me in the morning about 10 o'clock. I told him I had to see him and that it was so important that he fly down. He understood. I met him at 5 p.m. at the airport and we stayed at a hotel for the weekend. I knew I had to see Paul because I felt something was starting to go wrong. I knew I could only be strong for a certain amount of time, and I was getting too depressed. In trying to get over my depression, I had to think of Paul less and start enjoying myself with other people. I knew eventually that wouldn't work either. With those words, she broke off her memoir and never resumed. For Dorothy to call for help, the sexual pressure must have been intense. She needed an outlet for the guilt and outrage caused by the encounter in the jacuzzi, and she no doubt poured out her heart to Snyder, telling him everything that had happened. He was probably paternal and understanding that weekend and encouraged her to stay at Patrick's if she felt safer there. He would soon wrap things up in Vancouver and fly down to stay with her permanently and make sure no one ever bothered her again. He would also tell her not to alienate Hefner, no matter what he had done, he was still their bread and butter. Eventually, Dorothy moved in with Curtis, and Patrick became the platonic watchdog. By the end of October, 
Dorothy and I had been introduced, and Snyder had moved permanently to Los Angeles. He took Dorothy to Playboy's Halloween costume par party. Hefner and Curtis, and everyone else at the mansion, hated him on sight, though they spoke pleasantly enough to his face. The dress and manner of the street pimp conflicted harshly with the mansion's classier-looking clientele. Snyder was as out of place as a carnival barker at the ballet. In the photographs taken that night, posed between Stratton and Snyder, Hefner looked older than I had ever seen and more dispirited. His efforts had failed. He had given her his best shot and lost Dorothy to a sleazy pimp from Canada. His dream girl preferred a petty racketeer from the streets. The mansion's sex orgies continued, along with Hefner's requests for more naked footage of Stratton. Hefner customarily projected this material on the giant TV screens of his bedroom. When Molly Bachelor met Dorothy, soon after Snyder's arrival, she could tell almost immediately that Dorothy was not happy in the relationship. While Dorothy worked long and exhausting hours at the Playboy Club and still rose early for an exercise class with Molly, she had moved in by December 1978. Snyder slept late and stayed around the tiny Westwood apartment watching television all day. Soon Molly noticed that Dorothy would look for excuses to get away from the apartment and Snyder. She had been reticent at first to tell Molly that she had posed for Playboy. Molly had made her position on the magazine clear. She had little more than contempt for it. Later, Molly and Snyder would have several heated arguments on the subject. He wanted Molly to pose, too. Eventually, Dorothy told Molly how Snyder had pressured her into the Playboy business. Though Dorothy rarely complained, Molly would remember how angry with herself Dorothy had been on a number of occasions for having done the Playboy photos. She had tried to get straight modeling jobs and was turned down repeatedly because she had posed nude. When Molly asked why she stayed with Paul if she wasn't happy, Dorothy had difficulty expressing herself. She felt she owed Paul something, though Molly didn't agree. Snyder clearly was living off her. But Molly didn't know what had happened with Hefner or of Snyder's solicitude at that time, though eventually he would begin to use the information over Dorothy in order to make her feel guilty, responsible for the encounter. It was just something else he could tell her she owed him. If the Hefner incident had only sickened and humiliated Dorothy, as she claimed, didn't she owe it to Snyder to prove her abiding gratitude for his help and guidance? To return the love and attention he had showered on her? Yet Dorothy found excuses to be away from him and the apartment. She would take Molly with her to the mansion for a few pinball games or dinner and a movie, an afternoon swim or lunch. Dorothy never went alone, and they always left early. Also, they usually kept their visits a secret from Snyder, who would have insisted on going along. With Molly now as guardian and friend, Dorothy used the mansion's facilities to get away from the watchdog she had married to protect her from the mansion's men. It didn't take her very long to realize she was caught in a vicious cycle that seemed to have no escape except in men who were not much of an improvement on Paul Snyder. Though Dorothy never mentioned to Molly the pressures she had suffered from men at Playboy, Dorothy did tell her that a number of women at the mansion had made passes at her. It was another reason why she never went there alone. After nearly a year with Dorothy and Paul, Molly moved out. She was fed up with Snyder and the situation, from her viewpoint and Dorothy's. It was during this period that Dorothy called out to me in the mansion foyer, and we met a second time. Hefner's pressure on Dorothy continued. Beginning with her, Playboy made color movies of all Playmates for their cable and video cassette operations. So Hefner asked his photographers and cameramen for more shots and footage of more explicit poses. 
Dorothy would break down and cry, and Mario Casilli would feel badly, she later told me, but he was just doing his job. Hefner continued to admonish his staff to get sexier stuff from Stratton, more raunchy, indecent poses. Maybe he thought she would eventually come to him for help. The secretaries and assistants spoke repeatedly of how much Hef cared about her and how he even wanted her to be his new lady. But then Dorothy had seen photos of a spread, eagled Sandra Theodore. The magazine's contest staff confided that her lack of cooperation could lose her both the 25th anniversary prize and the chance for Playmate of the Year and the insiders kept whispering kindly, speak to Hef. When he discovered that Dorothy had moved into Patrick Curtis's house, one of Hefner's personal secretaries, Mary O'Connor, was dispatched to express the boss's dismay. Curtis was summoned to the mansion and asked of his intentions toward Dorothy. She and Patrick were just friends, he explained. Then why was she staying at Patrick's house? Because she had no money and needed a place to stay. But she was welcome at the mansion. She didn't want to stay at the mansion, Curtis told Mary. Would Hef prefer Dorothy to stay at a cheap motel? Yes, he was told, if she didn't want to stay at the mansion. Hef would prefer she live in a cheap motel. Like many aspiring models and actresses who arrive in Los Angeles courtesy of Playboy, Dorothy's own resources and contacts were few. This was even more apparent in her case because, being an alien, she was only allowed to work in the U.S. for Playboy and required their assistance in contracting for any other employment. She had lost her job at the Canadian Phone Company and had been advised to stay in Los Angeles to pursue modeling and film possibilities. As if to emphasize her lack of cooperation with Hefner and his photographers and the degree of her dependence on Playboy, Dorothy was given a morale-breaking job at the L.A. Playboy Club. Here she could wait on tables in six-inch heels and a humiliating costume, breasts and buttocks half-exposed, bunny ears flopping with every painful step, and endure with a smile the endless passes. She met Dr. Steve Kushner there. He had won a night at the club on TV's dating game, and he made the usual moves. Later, Kushner was to become a lodger at the house Dorothy shared with Snyder and a confidant of Snyder's. Two months after Dorothy's arrival at the mansion, Shortly before the Halloween party, she and I met for the first time. I had returned from Singapore and, after the breakup of my eight-year relationship with Sybil Shepherd, had embarked on a series of brief, meaningless affairs. By that Sunday at the mansion, at age 39, I had become fair game for nearly anything. But I was profoundly unhappy, all the more so because I loathed loathed the cynicism I began to feel for almost everything I had once held sacred. It was this world weariness that stopped me from following my instincts when I saw Dorothy that first time and immediately realized she was one of the most beautiful women I had ever seen. I was just leaving the mansion when one of Hefner's live-in pals introduced us. He said she was from Vancouver and I could tell by her quick strikingly open smile that she was quite young, though I would have guessed 20 rather than 18. The woman with her was Candy Loving, and though she was a rangy, attractive brunette, I glanced at her only occasionally so as not to stare at the blonde beauty. Obvious attention to any woman at the mansion, I knew by then, was carefully monitored and reported to the chief. Clearly, both Dorothy and Candy were physically too stunning not to be deeply enmeshed in the Playboy machinery. Hefner's buddy mentioned that Candy had won the magazine's 25th anniversary contest and that Dorothy was the only runner-up and would be a centerfold next year. 
My choice would have been different, I thought, as we chatted amiably for a few moments. I was trying to figure out how best to signal my interest in Dorothy without appearing ridiculous. After two years of dropping by, I had learned that the most beautiful women either were spoken for or soon would be, unless considerable time off the grounds could be devoted to the pursuit. And time was something I didn't have much of in those days, nor did Dorothy. Events were crowding in on top of us without a moment to pause for reflection. We were too busy trying to survive. Only the most routine signal seemed a good idea under the circumstances, so I wrote my name and phone number on a piece of Playboy notepaper and handed it to her. I said we were casting a picture, no doubt the oldest line in the business. Candy's smile was far more knowing than Dorothy's, and I could sense that Candy hadn't been insulted by my obvious preference for Dorothy. If anything, she seemed relieved, even pleased as though she agreed that Dorothy was lovely, which made me like her immediately. Dorothy's own smile was so radiant at that moment that I couldn't look at her for more than a few seconds. Her freshness gave me, ironically, a certain respect for Playboy. If such an obviously charming, intelligent woman could work with them, maybe they weren't so bad after all. Long after Dorothy was killed, I heard that she had asked about me. When Laura Bernstein interviewed Molly Bachelor after the murder, Molly remembered telling Dorothy that night a version of the Sybil Peter story. Anyone around the mansion could have reiterated a similar version of the tale. He broke up his marriage with a loyal wife and two kids, made a couple of flop pictures with Shepard and ruined both their careers. She left him for a hometown man younger than she, he hadn't had a hit in five years. His new movie was a cheapy shot in Singapore. Dorothy decided she wouldn't call me, though she made note of the number. When Molly had finished talking, Dorothy said, I bet he's a fake, and I thought she was taken. We were both half right. At the same time, Dorothy was dealing with the deadly trap into which she had fallen and trying to find a way out. I was looking for something, too. We were searching for each other, it would turn out, but the year we lost could never be recaptured, nor did the wounds we suffered during those months heal sufficiently not to affect our time together. Though I had a series of affairs, I was not using the women as a form of revenge against the one who had caused me pain. I understood why Sybil had left. Going from one woman to another having concurrent affairs and trying to remain friends by giving them all a good time with no strings attached, was in truth a search for one woman played out with the constant ache of loneliness and the overriding desire to find both true love and continuity. With two women, Colleen Camp and Patty Hansen, I had tried for a permanent relationship but failed miserably. Although my nature is essentially monogamous, I nevertheless found myself on the kind of sexual merry-go-round that very much caught the beat of the time. The commitmentless, shallow gratification of profound needs and desires. But I genuinely felt sympathetic with each woman and found it impossible to be completely casual. There were perhaps a score of women in that year, only two of whom I met at the mansion. The women's situations touched and troubled me. The majority of them, I discovered, rarely experienced much pleasure from their lovers. Yet, wasn't the Playboy Mansion the most elaborate temple of sexual promiscuity in the Western world? Why would anyone go there in search of a love that could last forever? The terrible irony was that not only did I find her there, but that I found her almost immediately and was too muddled to realize it until a year later. Even then, Dorothy recognized the truth before I did, though long afterward I would learn that in ancient courting customs, it was the woman who pursued the man. Hadn't the Hefners of the world reversed the natural order of things to such a degree that our roles and impulses were confused? Why else did I go to the mansion? 
curiosity, information, and a certain undeniable fascination with its popular and expensive bad taste. Hefner, Playboy, the mansion, the bunnies, the clubs, the whole setup were grotesque fifties kitsch. This cultural phenomenon was part of a world I knew I could never belong to or be comfortable in, but one I wanted to understand more than superficially. Rather quickly, however, the boys' camp atmosphere began to bore me. There was more beneath the surface, I knew, but to discover the layers meant joining in sexually, and group sex held a special repugnance for me. Once, I was tricked into a compromising situation at the mansion jacuzzi by Hefner Buddy using a young woman as bait. The incident sickened and estranged me further. I had also come to realize that the men of Playboy pursued women only for sex and rarely even had conversations with them. My visits to the mansion became briefer and more infrequent. By the time I first met Dorothy, I had already tired of the routine. Ironically, my disenchantment helped to keep us apart for a year. Dorothy's diminishing feelings for Snyder frightened her, even as his presence gave her a sense of protection. But she felt caged, exhausted, lost. She collapsed and lost 20 pounds. Her body would never recover its youthful bloom. Hefner saw the results in subsequent photo sessions and became anxious. What had happened to Dorothy? It took her several months to regain her strength. Playboy had decided she didn't have enough experience with the press to be the 25th anniversary playmate and scheduled her instead for the August 79 centerfold. The playmate of 1980 was a possibility, but she would have to be more cooperative in the photo sessions and pay more attention to Hefner. He could help her in so many ways. Soon after Dorothy's illness, an offer came from Winnipeg to star in the leading role of a small Canadian film to be called Autumn Born. The story's basic theme is a metaphor for her own emotional state at the time. A strong-willed young woman is kidnapped by an institution practicing mind control. Brainwashed for hours, she is alternately beaten, humiliated, starved, and raped by men and women. When she finally submits, she is fondled, then beaten and tortured again. Dorothy, worried about the many scenes requiring nudity, asked Curtis to read the script for her. He suggested she do the picture. She would be able to control the nudity, and it would be easier and more gratifying than Playboy. At least it was a lead role in a movie. How bad could it be? I didn't see the picture until four years after she made it, nearly three years after she was killed. I once asked her if it was any good, and she said, I wouldn't think so. We spent most of the time in a big house. None of the people involved behaved as though they had ever made a movie before. She was right. The picture is hopelessly amateurish on every level. Yet Dorothy is considerably more than believable and lovely beyond measure. Her hair had already been destroyed by a Playboy-recommended hairdresser. It was now bleached nearly white just the way Hefner had wanted it. When she had cried and threatened to sue, she was told it was an accident. She was much thinner than she was when we met the first two times, with her ribs protruding from her chest and back. Filmed six months after her 19th birthday, Dorothy's skinny body makes her look years younger. Her performance is never off key. It is clear she could identify with the situation. Though the scenes of her torture are meant to be titillating, the intensity of her feelings makes them touching, even heartbreaking. When she plays happily with the toy rat her jailer sent her, her behavior is extraordinarily realistic. The other players seem to treat her with a deference that veers from the plot. They can't get past neither her star quality nor her innocence. The sex scenes are shot as though she is a visiting celebrity. Yet Dorothy's acting is so pure and clean that the suffering of the character merges with her own. When Dorothy was chosen to be the August centerfold, Snyder began to pressure her to marry him before the issue appeared. Other movie and TV offers came in, and Snyder started talking of grandiose plans for posters and books and for a cosmetics and perfume company named after her. She was to be his main business. 
It did not take Dorothy long to see that Snyder didn't fit into the Hollywood scene. For her, he had lost his charm and become just another guy on the make. Dorothy often found him pathetic, but he had gotten her into the movies, as he had said he would. How could she turn against him now? In L.A., after a heated argument with Snyder, she wrote him, When storms are past and gone, shall gentle love succeed? I wish to ease a troubled mind. Sleep is the thing we need. With these few words I send my love, you will in this a question find. My question is without a doubt. Love is the question. Find it out. Shall gentle love succeed? Was the question, or perhaps love is the question itself. Still, the optimism was there, the feeling that no matter how bad the storms might be, Paul would eventually see the light, a hope not much rekindled by their first year in Los Angeles. Snyder made obvious passes at other women behind Dorothy's back and in front of her. He made several moves on Molly Bachelor, a particularly strong one in the kitchen at a time when Dorothy was away. He held the back of Molly's head and stared deeply into her eyes. Molly asked if he was trying to hypnotize her or something, and Snyder said yes. Was that what he had done with Dorothy? Molly asked, and Snyder smiled. Molly continued to look into his eyes and said he was evil. She laughed. Was he an agent of the devil? On June 1st, in Las Vegas, where he had pimped in past years, Paul Leslie Snyder married Dorothy Ruth Hoogstratton. She knew how unhappy her family would be and had expressed her dilemma to Molly. Should she marry Paul? If Dorothy had any doubts, Molly advised, why do it? But Snyder persuaded her. She felt sorry for him by then. And yet, Dorothy would tell Molly she did not let Paul touch her for more than two weeks after the marriage. His touch revolted her, Dorothy said. She didn't know why. The watchdog had extorted his reward. Marriage, 50-50, till death do us part. At the seedy wedding service in Las Vegas, Snyder's best man was Jake, his main drug connection. Another Snyder friend gave away the bride. Dorothy didn't tell her family until several weeks later. If Dorothy thought of the marriage as an act of self-protection, there was an undeniable sense of having given up. Despite the TV and movie offers that came in, she felt her life was hopeless. By the end of August 1979, a year before her death, she wrote, I am lonely, with a hundred people treating me with the world's best of everything. When Snyder gave her a small, live, white rat, she adopted it as, as a sign of love, forgetting for the moment the meaning of the toy rat she had played with in the Canadian film. Wasn't it sent by her captors only to torture her further? She had told Snyder the plot and didn't want to think about the ominous implication of his gift. She called the rat Bibi, like the little dog she had loved and left behind with her family. Love Snyder, love his rat, Perhaps in return, he wouldn't insist on much sex. Before Dorothy and I met the second time, her romantic feelings for Snyder had ceased entirely, and three or four weeks would pass before Snyder insisted on making love. But he could tell she felt nothing. Dorothy mistook Snyder's devotion during her illness for love, though he had simply nursed his investment back to health so that she could continue her lucrative career. He knew this was only the beginning. The marriage gave him not only 50% of her income, but the right to stay in the U.S. as long as she did. When any of his other grand schemes didn't pan out, the motorcycle jump by Evil Knievel, the male strip joint, his failure only made Dorothy feel sorrier for him. She couldn't seem to find a way off the treadmill. The agent, recommended by a Playboy associate who made passes, the lawyer, recommended by another Playboy associate who tried to assault her in his office, the continuing daily pressures from Hefner's organization. Maybe, she often thought, that was it. She was lost. She had lost. There was nothing to be done. In the summer of 1979, I had begun a script called They All Laughed, with a character based on myself, which I originally intended to play, although John Ritter would ultimately be cast in the role. 
In every draft until I met Dorothy again that October, the character went through the picture pining for the girl he had loved and lost because he wouldn't commit himself to marriage and children. The Ritter character was as melancholy at the end as he had been at the beginning. A deal was struck with Time Life Film Productions to finance this version, with shooting to start in New York after the first of the year. Cost, $7.5 million. But the script was weak, I decided. No better than my life. I didn't like being sad or melancholy. Like Dorothy, I was lost. All the women I had had affairs with couldn't take the place of loving one woman and sharing a life with her. I was ready for the second meeting with Dorothy.